Thanks for taking the time to join our webinar today. This is part one of the Mainframe to Cloud webinar series. In this series, we share our secrets on how to successfully transition mainframe applications to the cloud so that you can retire your legacy systems that they are currently running on. If you have any questions, we ask you to put them in the Q&A box and we'll try to answer them at the end. Now I'd like to introduce the host of this webinar series, Walter Sweat. Walter is the CTO of Stadia and has spent most of his career working on mainframes. Now, without further ado, I'll hand it over to Walter. Ari, thank you very much. Uh, I really do appreciate it. And thank you everyone for taking the time out of your busy day to join our webinar today. As Ari mentioned, this is the first in a series of webinars that we're gonna be put to get, putting together to talk about our experiences and our customers' experiences as they have moved from the mainframe. Um, we think that it's important to share this information so that for those of you who are running in a mainframe environment today and who might be considering alternatives uh, to kind of know what other people have gone through. So for us, when we look at that, the, the most critical question is, where do I start? If you've never migrated from the mainframe, it's almost impossible to understand, you know, all the things that you need to know and the things that you need to consider as you look at the alternatives. First and foremost, as an organization, we always recommend that, you know, you understand what your direction is. There are going to be people in an organization who are going to say, I don't want to do anything different than I do today. There are going to be people who say we need to do things completely differently than we do today. Getting buy-in and understanding as an entire group that you have a consistent goal is really a very, very important first step. Um, beyond that, we always suggest a, a couple of consistent approaches, things to do. Uh, and immediately, that means start with a roadmap lay out ahead of time all the things that you need to think about and have a plan in place so that you know how you can get where you want to go. For us, that means that you really want to understand what all of the options are. We've talked in the past about uh, mainframe migrations being a continuum or a journey, and we think they really are. And there are no two organizations that are going to end up in exactly the same spot or take the same routes to get there. But understanding what all of those options are so that you can make the best decision for your organization is absolutely critical as you look at your alternatives. Um, there are a couple of things that we kind of look at in general terms that are important to consider. For some people, staying on the mainframe is exactly the right answer. We understand that. We recognize that the mainframe is a great environment uh, and it does a wonderful job. So being able to find ways to modernize in place is gonna be the right answer for many organizations. For some people who say, you know, I need to because of cost or a problem with getting personnel who can maintain my systems, I need to get off of the mainframe. For many of them, phase migrations make an awful lot of sense. Uh, where they can go through and say, I'm gonna, I'll use the phrase, take a bite out of this elephant at a time. I'm not going to eat the whole elephant at one time. So a phased migration can be a great approach for many people. For others, however, a Big Bang approach absolutely does make sense. Uh, for some organizations, based on expiring contracts or hardware that's about to die or hardware and software that's out of support and can't be supported anymore, getting off of the mainframe in one fell swoop is the right answer for them. Again, we don't think that there is one right answer for everyone. So starting with a roadmap that helps you define where you want to go will help you define how you get there. We think it's important that on the front end, you really understand all of the challenges that can come about when you're considering moving off of your mainframe. Um, Obviously, your legacy components, your source code, your data files, all of the third-party components that are a part of your inventory today have to be accounted for. Um, and then deciding what are going to be the replacements for those items as you move from the mainframe is going to be absolutely uh, critical 
to being able to ensure that you have a successful migration if that's what you decide to do. And we think it's important on the front end to really, really utilize the right tools to help you understand how you can successfully uh, make this migration or modernization possible. For us, that usually starts with assessments. We believe that in order to know effectively how to get to where you want to go, you have to know where you're starting from. So an assessment showing you everything that really is on your mainframe is a really important component of this process and this journey. And discovery, not just doing the, uh, the counting of items, the knowing the numbers of artifacts, but understanding the relationships between them as they exist in your current environment so that you can understand what those relationships need to look like when you do your modernization. Those are kind of the steps that we here at Estadia always try to follow. Now, as we talk about understanding your options, I'm gonna kind of go through those in a little more detail. Uh, I mentioned modernizing in place, which is a perfectly acceptable and great solution for many people. And the way that we here at Estadia see a lot of uh, customers looking at this is to leverage something that's uh, very important today, and that's APIs. Being able to keep the backbone of your processing in place, but via APIs to be able to open up how that processing is handled um, has been a very successful modernization strategy for many organizations. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a couple of slides. And also something that we have found to be very important is the ability to do data replication and look at storing data in different ways than perhaps you can store it today, which has seriously um, improved the capabilities of many companies in being able to do business in ways different than they ever have before. You know, let's face it, in today's economy, it's very competitive, much less with everything else that's going on. But organizations, your competitors are responding quicker and quicker to changing business needs. And you need to be able to do that as well. So by being able to put your data in environments, whether it's data lakes or warehouses or uh, any of the myriad number of data options that are out there, you now have the ability to use your data as a resource in ways that perhaps you've never been able to before so that you can make quicker and better business decisions so that you are more competitive in your own marketplace. For phase migrations, uh, we always recommend that you want to go through and be able to understand your siloed applications those application areas that have the fewest touch points to everything else. There, there is no one easy button that you push and things just automatically happen, as we all know. Uh, but by being able to minimize the number of touch points between applications that you're looking to modernize in different ways or to migrate off of the mainframe, um, it increases your chances of being able to do it successfully and on schedule. So looking for applications that don't have touch points back to applications still running on the mainframe or data that's still going to stay on the mainframe. There almost always is something that you'll have where you'll have to uh, create a method to handle those touch points, but minimizing the touch points is critical. For people who are doing big bang migrations, there are a couple of components that you always want to think about going ahead of time. Big bang means it's probably gonna take a little longer to see some of the benefit. Whereas the phase migration, you'll see smaller successes as you go along. With Big Bang, um, you're going to have a situation where you're not going to be able to stop doing development. You'll need to continue to be able to make changes to your applications, uh, structures, and the components that exist on your mainframe today. So you need to plan ahead of time for how you're going to do those retrofits. If I start moving everything over and then I'm changing the program four or five times during that process, you need to have a plan in place that allows you to ensure that those changes end up all at the same place at the same time, doing what they need to do just as they are on your mainframe today. 
The other thing that we always talk to clients about is that it's imperative to kind of get a sign up. Everybody needs to be on the same page to say, you know, during this time, we're going to minimize the number of data definition changes that are going on while we're doing a migration or modernization effort. You can't be changing structures willy-nilly um, while you're trying to do this migration effort. So it needs to be an agreed upon platform that those kinds of changes will be held to a minimum. Um, and getting people to sign up on that on the front end is critical. Talking about modernization in place APIs and data replication, the API economy is a real thing out there today. In this marketplace, there are a, a large number of options that exist that allow people to, as I mentioned before, leave their core backbone processing in place where they can leverage what they are always been able to do, but to do it in different ways without having to write new programs. In some cases, you don't use any code at all to be able to leverage the API economy. And an API is just an entry point that says the mainframe does everything well that it does today, and it will continue to do that, but I can interface to it in ways that are different than what I would have done 25 years ago when I first wrote those applications. I can create interfaces to mobile and social uh, media today from the mainframe. I can leverage big data and cloud processing through APIs. Um, I can leverage data replication in the cloud so that I can take data that was in vSAM and move it to a relational model so that I can do different things with it. All of these modernization in place strategies are very, very effective and they are perfect examples for many organizations. For people who do want to move from the mainframe though, as we talked about phase migrations, graphically this just kind of represents what I'm talking about. This is a, a scattershot diagram showing the relationship amongst various components in a mainframe application. Uh, as we look at this, I'm gonna move my mouse and hopefully you can see my cursor moving. We can identify that, you know, just by looking at this, that this little application here is more dense and more complex than perhaps this little application area at the top, which doesn't have as many touch points. These touch points, these interfaces into and out of the scattershot diagrams are the things that we want to look at and understand as we consider uh, that we might want to do a phased migration. Well, here's a completely different picture, obviously. This is a much more complex application set. And if you think about and I want you to think about, um, as you look at your alternatives for mainframe modernization and migration, what are the risks that you want to avoid? Well, one of the most important risks is you want to avoid upsetting your business rules. You don't wanna change things from the ways they've always worked. You have to protect the integrity of your business rules. So looking at much more complex areas with hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of touch points, if you go through and re-architect that completely, there is a risk involved, we think, uh, in doing so. So this might be a prime candidate to say, I want to consider just taking this and moving it to another environment, the cloud, but I'll keep the architecture basically the same. Again, there is no one right or wrong answer for everyone that we'll talk to, and your environments will be different than everyone else's. But kind of understanding what the options are is critically important as you move forward. Um, and we talked about retrofits and data definition changes. This is where it gets to be really critical, especially data definition changes as we look at this. If you consider you're moving everything over to a new environment and in the middle you start to change what a SQL table looks like or a vSAM file looks like. There is a large density here of things that will have to be changed and you want to account for that. That's one of the reasons that we would always recommend looking at Big Bang different than some of the other options that are out there. I mentioned that we think it's important that you understand the challenges you're going to face, and there will be some. There always are. Um, 
understanding your legacy components. Um, as I said, the inventory of what you have. And it mystifies me the number of organizations we have the opportunity to talk with who truly don't know everything that they have running in their environment, which is kind of a good news, bad news thing when you think about it. The bad news is they may not know that it's there. The good news is it usually means that it was something that was written way in the past, 20 years ago or more, by someone who probably is still no longer with the organization, but it's worked the same way every single day, producing the accurate results. So by understanding the challenges, recognizing everything that you have in your environment, that's a critical first step. Understanding those legacy components is key. And then understanding how you do a component mapping, as I mentioned before. Mentioned before. Every program, every language, every third-party product, every utility has to be evaluated. Uh, and while it may seem daunting to consider that, it, it truly is a, a science experiment. You go through and define everything that's there. You define what the mappings will be and find the alternatives. And there always are alternatives. So being able to define that on the front end as you go through this process and realizing you're going to have to do that is an important step. And again, the reason I mentioned these things is we here at Estadia have done 200 plus of these projects. We know that we run into these things. On our very first one, we didn't know everything we were going to run into. So if you haven't yet done one of these modernization migration projects, uh, you know, what we're trying to share is these are the things that will be critical to your success. In terms of the legacy components, you know, when we talk about the mainframe, not always, but 95 plus percent of the time, people start with COBOL. There's going to be some COBOL out there. Um, for the IBM mainframes, there are oftentimes is CICS, sometimes there's IMS. Um, there are going to be technologies that are pretty consistent amongst most of the mainframe organizations that are out there today. But that's not what everyone has. Understanding what you've got is an important first step. You know, as we start to widen out, some people are gonna have Rex, some people are gonna have EasyTree. Almost everyone has some amount of assembler. As you start to move further out from the core of just a COBOL application, um, you start to see that there are different technologies that come into place. And we certainly have talked to organizations who have used every one of these plus more. I think in total, we have uh, worked with over 30 different mainframe technologies that we've had to find solutions for. So the closer you are to this core, usually the easier the solution is for you as you look to do a mig migration or modernization. As you start to come out from that circle and you work with these other technologies, there are solutions in place. What you want to consider though is that if you have a solution that works for part of your environment, but you have to do something different with the other parts, you want a consistent provided solution in the end. You don't want to, for instance, most likely convert um, PL1 to COBOL if in other areas you're gonna be converting COBOL to C Sharp or Java, for instance. So finding a consistent solution we think is very important. And then as we go out from there, you know, there are gonna be other technologies and you have to kind of understand what's there. We run into model 204, UFO, Telon, power builder front ends where CICS has been completely removed from an environment, Mantis, uh, Goots. Uh, I don't know if any of you have ever heard of Goots, but I think that there are two existing customers in the world who still use that technology. Um, but understanding what you have is critical to being able to understand where you're going to go. Now, we talked about component mapping. Um, as we talk about everything in your inventory base, all of the components that are there, it is imperative, I feel, to be able to go through and say, what are my options for being able to move forward? So for languages, you know, you can convert. You can take COBOL and leave it as COBOL, or you can convert it to a different language. For databases, you have different options where you can take your data. 
Uh, we think that it is extremely critical to have a well laid out plan on the front end, defining everything that you have and defining what that's going to look like in the new environment. Um, and then the next topic that we wanted to talk about was making sure that you utilize the right tools as you consider what you're going to do with your mainframe environment. To us, the most critical tool, as I mentioned before, is an assessment to understand where you're starting from. And then the discovery process to come up with a mapping for where you're going to. Um, when we talk about assessments, to me, assessments give you power. They give you the ability to understand what you have today. Uh, what is frightening is if you don't understand what you have today. And where that often happens is uh, in acquisitions. A company acquires another company, but they don't really understand everything that's in that new environment, even though they're going to be responsible for maintaining it moving forward. So an assessment is a powerful tool for those kinds of situations where people need to ensure that they understand what's in their repertoire. It helps you conquer the unknown. The thing that's scary is not knowing what you're going to run into. So being able to take the science portion of an assessment where you're defining metrics, you're counting components, you're understanding the interfaces that exist in your system, those are the unknowns that you really want to get past as you consider your alternatives. Obviously, it's really critical to make informed decisions. You can't really make an informed decision on something you don't understand. The assessment is that, as one of my uh, colleagues always called it, a flashlight in the dark, where you don't really know what's there, but you shine the light on it, and then you start to be able to make decisions about what really is in that dark corner and how best you want to handle it. And information helps drive estimation. Um, one of the things that you'll want to do as you go through this process is to understand what it's going to take in terms of both time and money and resources uh, to be able to consider your alternatives. So the assessment is the driving engine between the uh, the, or for the process that lets you understand the real costs of doing a migration or modernization effort. And I've mentioned this a couple of times, and I think it's really true. There is an art and there is a science to an assessment. The science portion really is going through and defining what the number of artifacts are and the way they're related. That's easy. There are a lot of tools that will allow you to do that. Uh, and they will dive as deep as you need to go to be able to give you that information. The art part of the assessment process helps you decide what to do with the information. So once you know what all of the metrics are, what all of the dependencies are, making a decision as to what you do with it. Do I consider refactoring? Should I consider replatforming my environment? Should I leave it exactly as it is and modernize in place? Those are the kinds of things that you want to derive from an assessment. I'm going to just show you a couple of slides from a typical assessment report and the kinds of things that you'll want to consider. Obviously, a, a dashboard that defines, you know, what you have and how many of every kind is absolutely the, the right starting point. But there are other components that are out there that are important as well. So as you look at alternatives, finding a tooling or a partner who can help drive this process for you is really important because it's hard to just develop this all on your own, in my opinion. Uh, but understanding that you've got vSAM um, and that you have a large number of inbound interface files. An inbound interface file is something that's coming from another system. If you move off of your mainframe, how are those inbound interface files going to be altered? What has to happen to them? Do they need to be converted from EBCDIC to ASCII? Uh, are, are they in a format that is only known to the mainframe? All of those are the hard questions that you'll want to understand as you go through here. Um, if you have variable length files in JCL and you're looking to migrate, that's something that isn't 
always natively supported, oftentimes it is, but every one of these items has a decision point that you'll want to go through to determine how you're going to work with this as you move off of the mainframe, if that is your goal. And being able to understand things like, um, you know, the system programs that are in place. Um, not all system programs, IBM or Unisys, that are coming from the mainframe are natively supported in other environments. Sometimes you have to allocate time to say, we're going to have to rewrite this functionality. Uh, if that's 0.111% of your entire mainframe migration, that's not a big deal. But if you have something that's a bigger percentage, you want to know that going in so that you can have the proper estimate to know what your uh, migration and modernization alternatives are really going to cost you. And then there are always going to be components like references to C runtime modules. Well, those are interfaces that need to be defined on the front end so that you really understand how you're going to work with that moving forward. And again, I don't want you to consider this, you know, really daunting, like, oh my gosh, that's a lot of things I've got to really think about. It can be, but it's a defined list. It's things that people have encountered that they know to look for. And if this is your first time doing it, being able to leverage that experience, we think is really important. I'll just show you a couple of more slides here, but things that really come into play, um, like averages, like what's the average lines of code of all of my modules? How complex are they? Do I need to worry about the complexity based on business rules? If I refactor, do I stand the chance of losing some of that information? Uh, these are part of the transition points between science and art as you look at this information. Um, things like go-to statements, which are notoriously uh, ill thought of as they should be, but in other languages, if a go-to statement isn't even supported, what are you going to do with that um, is something that you'll want to think about when you consider the different alternatives you have in coming from the mainframe. Uh, finding dead lines and dead data elements to get rid of that out of your environment. Even if you're modernizing on the mainframe, going through and doing an assessment so that you can identify that you can get rid of an average of 723 lines per COBOL and assembler program in this environment uh, by just removing it or commenting it out, that makes it easier without having to worry about somehow that ever um, finding its way back into your code, or if you're migrating from one language to another, having to migrate code that you really don't use today. So we talked about assessment. When we talk about discovery, that's, um, that's where we really start to integrate the other components that exist in the mainframe environment today. We think it's important that you make what I call holistic decisions. I've talked to so many folks who say, you know, I'm, I'm going to make migrate from my mainframe and that means I need to convert my COBOL programs and I need to move my data and they think that that's going to be it for them but it won't be. Um, holistic decisions means that your mainframe is made up of programs and data and utilities and uh, third-party products and homegrown utilities and um, a multitude of different artifacts that you need to consider. And you have to make a decision on each one of those. You have to understand everything that's on the mainframe, and you have to be able to have a mapping in place to define what's going to replace it as you look at migrating to the cloud. So a couple of the areas that we're talking about, you know, on many mainframe systems, there's accounting and chargeback where they have to account for what uh, amount of time and processing occurs for every department. Well, if that exists on the mainframe, it needs to exist off of the mainframe as well. There can be automation and event management so that you're able to monitor what's going on on the mainframe. You'll want to do that in the cloud as well. The beauty of the cloud, I'll just throw this out here now, is that in many cases, that sort of functionality is inherently built in so you can leverage something that's already in place, which is a great, great benefit. 
Here's an important one, defining all of the external interfaces that you have in place. Are you using DB2 Connect to be able to let uh, applications off of the mainframe talk to the mainframe? Are you using socket processing? Um, is LU 6.2 part of your uh, portfolio that you have to account for because uh, an LU device is talking to your mainframe? Going through and understanding all of these components is critically important, as I've said. Do you have tapes today? What are you going to do with tapes in the future? Are you just going to leverage virtual tapes? Uh, and you may be doing that already, but this is a part of the process. Systems management. You know, does Omegamon help drive your understanding of what your application environment is today? And then source code management. Uh, you know, how do you keep up with source changes today? There are a multitude of options as you move forward. So for every one of these that we talked about, and probably the half a dozen more that exist that I can't fit on this screen, being able to recognize what you have in place today and recognize what the replacement for it is going to be is a part of this process. When you took that first step on this journey, this is what it's leading you to, to be able to make these kinds of decisions. Um, and other parts of discovery, storage, you know, understanding environmentally, what do you have today? Uh, is it in vSAN? Is it in a relational model? Is it in IMS? Uh, and having a mapping that says what it's going to be for you as you move to the cloud, that's important. You have to consider things like high availability and your backup environment and what you're gonna do for disaster recovery. Um, those are critical elements to be able to have planned in place so that you can define what your cloud environment's going to look like. Are you gonna do backup natively via the cloud? Are you gonna have VMs running? Those are all the kinds of questions that you're going to want to ask as you start this journey. And then for data, as we mentioned before, you know, understanding what you've got, how do you handle batch processing? What is your batch job schedule? Uh, your online environment, what are the statistics that you'll want to compare to? Those are all critical elements that as you go through this journey, you need to have answers for in place. So in summary, um, we think it's important to define that roadmap. We absolutely believe that to understand where you want to go, you have to understand how you want to get there. Um, and you need to know from where you started. And we always suggest make informed decisions. There's no such thing as too much information about how you can make your decisions in your cloud journey from the mainframe. Um, a defined process, something that has been proven time and time again, will assist you as you go through this. And most importantly, um, and this is the part that I know I forgot in my first mainframe migration, you have to consider everything that's there. You can't just assume that things take care of themselves. So it is a uh, detailed process that we always recommend that you consider as you look at uh, how you get from the mainframe to the cloud. So next steps, um, we here at Stadia, if we can ever assist with any of this, we would love the opportunity to. Uh, you know, we offer free code assessments. Um, our goal is to help people understand, does this make business sense for me or not? If I'm considering moving from my mainframe to the cloud, if you've never done it, how do you know what it's going to cost and what the effort is? Well, from the assessment and the processes we go through, uh, we would love to have the opportunity to help define for you what a rough order of magnitude level of effort might be for that. And it's important, we think, that you have the understanding of what the potential return on investment might be. So those for us are next steps that uh, we are delighted to be able to participate in if we ever can. Um, and just in closing, I'd like to say people have successfully done that. I hope by you being here on the webinar, it's a sign that it is something that you're at least considering. Uh, and that if so, you can take comfort in knowing that absolutely people have done this. This is a reality today. Uh, 
people are seeing at least as good a performance in the cloud as they did on their mainframe and people are absolutely saving a ton of money in being able to consider that as an alternative. So at this point, I think I'm just gonna open this up for any questions that we might have. Um, and I see a couple here, I'm just gonna try to take them uh, in order here. Can you share with us the slides? Yes, absolutely, we can do that. And what's the average time it takes for an enterprise to migrate its applications from the mainframe to the cloud? I'm gonna give the answer that no one ever wants to hear, and that is, of course, it depends. Um, it, there is no one single measure that you can look at to say, with 100% certainty, uh, this defines how long it would take to go to the cloud. It's not MIPS. Uh, there are some times when a smaller mainframe, it could take longer to migrate to the cloud than a larger mainframe. It has more to do with the complexities and the technologies that you have in place today. Um, remember the circles that we put up or the ovals that we put up with the different technology environments and tools? The more of those you have, uh, usually the more complex the migration is because there's more interfaces between all of the different components. But on average, I would say, you know, for a small mainframe environment, um, we've seen them be able to be migrated in as short as six months. Uh, up to nine months for a medium, probably nine months to 12 months uh, for a large 12 to 18 months and for a very large environment. Uh, you know, those can of course be multi-year environments and uh, migrations uh, that come into play. One of the things that we try to do here at Estadia anyway is via our questionnaires and via the assessments to come up with an estimate for you that says, you know, based on our experiences and our customers' experiences and our understanding of your environment, that we can give you a realistic determination of what that might look like. So that would be our goal if, uh, if that would ever be of help. Are there any other questions at this point in time? Hey, Walter, it looks like we got a question in uh, the message box. Um, okay. And it goes, uh, so you talk about APIs, what about microservices? So microservices are absolutely a, a, a very valid alternative for people. And what's interesting um, with the technologies that exist today, being able to leverage microservices from the mainframe uh, is a reality. And surprisingly for many people, being able to take those mainframe application environments, even a COBOL application, and pull it to the cloud environment and leverage microservices from there, that really is a, that's a real thing, as I mentioned before. Um, you have that capability to do microservices. You can leverage technologies like containerization. Um, and understanding what is most important to you as you move forward is what's gonna help drive that decision process, I think. We talk to a lot of organizations who say, I'm, I'm interested in just saving money and moving off. That's one set of decision points for them. There are other organizations who say, I need to do things differently than I've ever done them before. I don't need a batch process anymore. I need to have real-time data all the time because my competitors who never have had a mainframe um, have that capability. So they have to be more competitive. So being able to consider re-architecting your environment to leverage uh, microservices is, a, uh, is something that does exist both on and off of the mainframe. Okay. Um, there's a question here about DevOps. Can you leverage DevOps, which is obviously a very hot topic today, uh, in a mainframe migration and modernization path? Yes, absolutely. Um, we think that it's critical that people, if they don't have DevOps in place today, and I've talked about being responsive, and that's one of the things that DevOps really generates a benefit for, is to be more responsive and consistent. 
So if people don't have DevOps environment today on their mainframe, as they start to consider modernization and migration alternatives, being able to implement DevOps as a part of that journey yields huge benefits for them. Uh, one, they're learning how to do it as they're moving along. Two, when they are at whatever end point in that continuum or journey that they're on comes out to be, they have in place an environment where they can leverage continuous integration and continuous deployment, where they can take advantage of things like automated testing. I can't tell you the number of uh, organizations and companies we talk to who have no test cases at all in place. And it's a real challenge for them. Their test cases have to do with the programmers who wrote the applications 25 years ago, running it and looking at it and saying, yep, that looks right. Well, what happens when those people retire? Um, you know, an organization like that, in my opinion, is in kind of a dire strait. They have a real problem, whether they have realized it yet or not, uh, or have encountered it. I'm sure they realize it, but it's going to be a situation where they need to have that environment in place. So integrating DevOps into this migration and modernization process to the cloud has a huge built-in advantage and benefit for organizations. Thanks for that question. Okay, well, Ari, it looks to me like we are just about at the end of our time. Uh, unless there are any other questions, um, I'm just going to say to everyone, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. As Ari had mentioned earlier, this is the first in what we hope to be a, uh, a long series of uh, webinars where we talk about ours and our clients' experiences and what they've been able to do as they've moved from the mainframe to the cloud. And we hope to share those experiences with you so that as you look at your alternatives, you have all the information that you need. With that, thank you everyone, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.